Welcome to the Impact Shows powered by Fintech TV on CNBC Africa. My name is Kavata Gupta. And I'm Vince Molinari, and we're very fortunate again to be broadcasting from the New York Stock Exchange again today. And Vince, today whom we are highlighting is such an amazing individual. He's as much a son of the African continent with a Ghanaian father, a Nigerian mother, but similarly as much an American and European product with his dad being pretty much an African ambassador to the world. Well, I think when you look at the epitome of a global citizen and the recognition that we're all part of the same planet, and I think that is so evident in what Kofi Annan's leadership was and to see the legacy not only being carried on but being amplified by Kojo is just an amazing benefit that we have here today. So nothing to guess, it's Kojo Anand today. We are very excited to talk to him about his journey, a lot about his investments in Africa and how does he want to project Africa to the global scale. I'm very, very excited about our today's guest. The cat is already out of the bag, but what I really love and what we're going to talk about is the journey a journey of being a true global citizen, finding your roots, but at the same time balancing it by taking your roots and showcasing it to the rest of the world. Hi Kojo, it's a pleasure to have you on The Impact powered by Fintech TV. How are you doing today? Hi Kabita, thank you for having me. I'm doing great, thank you. So I would start with a very simple question the whole world has gone through a lot of changes in last year and a half, and it's still evolving to find its new balance, new normal. Uh, being in Africa, especially in Ghana, um, what is the new normal? What is the new balance for you and for the country? Um, yeah, it's a very interesting question. I think, um, well, as I said to some other friends recently, I think the whole world, wherever you are, went through a great period of um, introspection um, during the time of COVID. I think we all we all were forced to slow down, take stock, reflect. I think um, the outcome in Africa, um, from my perspective, has been um, uh, it's been clear to me that there's a there's a strengthening, increasing um, pride in Africa and in young Africans and Africans in general, very proud of, of their countries and their continents. Um, we were fortunate here in Ghana that we had great leadership from, from the president leading from the front through the, through the fight against COVID. And um, I think we've all seen the leadership has played a great role in how countries have handled the pandemic. And I think um, despite all the loss and suffering, there was a sense that there has been a renewed sense of optimism, particularly in Africa, with the, with the leap to... Um, the di digital transformation and all the potential that brings to the continent, you know, teaming with entrepreneurial talent and know-how. And whilst, you know, everybody was locked down, I think the creative juices and the, the creative minds were really allowed to express themselves. And I think um, there's um, great optimism and potential for the future. But of course, everybody is still very focused that we have to get a handle on the pandemic make sure all of the citizens are you know, safely taken care of, and then we can slowly get, I wouldn't say get back, go forward into the new reality or the new normal, as you call it. Um, Kojo, uh, I want to go back to you growing up. Um, when I think about um, as a young person and traveling across the globe, I used to find myself always out of the place, always a different one. It must be even somewhere more for you because you not only was traveling during your summer vacations, you did have an opportunity with an amazing parents and family to actually grow up parts of Europe, part of US. What has been your experience of growing up as an African kid, as a Ghanaian kid? Um, yeah, um, that's an interesting one. Well, for me growing up, I was, you know, as, as I said from, from the beginning, my father's Ghanaian, my mother's Nigerians, I was always felt very Pan-African, you, you know, you, you can't really choose sides with those two countries, you have to stay in the middle. Um, but essentially, yes, as you said, I grew up, you know, many parts of my life in Switzerland, London and States. And um, I guess as a young person, you don't really think of many of the issues that you think of later in life. So 
I just saw myself like every other kid having a great time, meeting lots of people from different cultures. I think you, you become very adaptable because you're used to being in different places. So sort of um, an unusual setting doesn't really hinder you or affect you because you're used to sort of being quite flexible, um, going from cultures and creeds. Um, obviously, um, yeah, I also went to boarding schools, you know, so there were certain cultural shocks, but I think that having been a regular traveler, you become adaptable and, and you, you actually find commonality wherever you go. So as a young kid, it could be the sports you like or the fashion you're into or the music or whatever, but you tend to find common ground um, wherever you find your feet, yeah. So I, I, I think the, the lesson for me was that there was, we have much more commonality than differences. Beautifully said, Gojo. Um, but there's also a very interesting and unique part to your life. In school, there are commonalities like that, but you also, uh, because of Mr. Kofi Annan, lived through a lot of history-making changes when those histories were being made at different international bodies. Was that a day-to-day -day night conversation and your uh, knowledge about diplomacy and world states started on your dinner tables at five or eight? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, to, to be honest, my dad did used to always like talking to us about the news. Looking back now, retrospectively, yes, there was a little bit of that. I mean, it wasn't a huge feature, but he did like to know that you were abreast of what's happening in the world in general. Um, and that, that was, you know, a feature of dinner, but it's essentially just like everyone else. Most of the time, he was just a dad, like everyone, like every other dad is more concerned about your schoolwork. Are you doing well in school? Have you done your homework? Are you following up for your exams? And, you know, just preparing you for, for life in general. He was, he, he was quite keen on you keeping fit and healthy right until, you know, his very last days, his focus was on people being healthy and fit and, you know, sharp body, sharp mind, and, you know, just the general things that most parents, I guess, go through with their kids dealing with, you know, young teenagers, etc. You grew up to be on a world, world being your oyster. Why did you come decide to be back in Africa and uh, be more representative of Africa? Like, where did this uh, idea of there is so much in Africa which needs a world stage and maybe I can be that bridge? really that idea started germinating in your head? Um, well, actually, um, growing up, you know, as I said, even though we lived overseas, um, my mother's Nigerian, I said my father Ghana, so every holiday, well, at least once a year, would either be in Accra or Lagos, or sometimes both. And then um, growing up, when I was in school in the UK, my closest friends were actually um, my mother's friends' kids. So I had a lot of actually Nigerian friends growing up. And then after I left university, I moved to Lagos, actually. Um, um, and I lived in Lagos for many years. And anybody from Lagos will tell you it's one of the most entrepreneurial cities in the world. Obviously, it has its own issues and it can be quite chaotic, but it's, it's teeming, it's buzzing full of entrepreneurial spirit. And once you get it, you know, once you get engaged, it's very hard for that bug to leave you. And um, so that was where I think I first caught the, the attraction of the opportunities in Africa because everybody's an entrepreneur in Lagos. Mm -hmm. And then um, I lived there for you know, 10, 12 years, back and forth from Nigeria to London and across to Accra, but Lagos was the base. And that was sort of my reconnection with Africa and back home. And you know, that never left me. And so where is your base today? What do you call home? Today, my base is Accra. Um, to be totally honest, it was a direct result of the pandemic. Prior to, the, prior to COVID, we were living in London. Then I came with my family to... Um, I, I actually came for a funeral, unfortunately. I, I lost a friend, nothing to do with COVID. I came to, for the funeral, and then they were about to shut down the borders. Everybody was panicking. I was about to rush back to London to join my wife and kids. And a few of my friends here said, why don't you tell them to come this way? You have more space outdoors living i have young children so i convinced my wife to get on the plane come this way and we've never been back to, to london since yeah um Koja, i want to move towards a lot of companies a lot of social enterprises you have been involved in 
you have a family office uh, vector global under which you invest or support advise a lot of early startups which who has been representing africa globally tell us about some of the really really amazing companies from healthcare sectors to fintech to handicrafts which has which you think has already a potential of being the next unicorns from africa yeah well i mean i think everyone has been slowly seeing and you know very well yourself can be to the, the the growth in um tech and innovation in africa in particular um as vector we are quite opportunistic in our investing we tend to look at the um try and back the right management teams with the right vision um but we've seen obviously like yourselves the the wave of fintech unicorns that have come out primarily out of the nigeria based that flux wave um we had interswitch before that and we believe there's many more coming believe it's, it's just the start of creating a much bigger ecosystem so we've invested in a range of companies that we believe will be in the second wave or third wave behind some of those com- companies i've just mentioned um but it's not just fintech where we're seeing innovation we're seeing it in culture we're seeing it in fashion music and entertainment you're seeing it in health technology you you you're generally seeing it across the board lo- logistics um one of the companies we're very excited about we've invested and led the led the investment and I share a company called Made in Africa which is essentially is um um an african house of brands we we believe it it's the time now for the world to see what africa has to offer in terms of culture high fashion um and we we're, we're very excited about where this company is going um we're going it's going to have a house of both high end brands and also fast fashion brands representing the culture and primarily made in africa and we also have a much bigger plan around impacting a uh, small holder farmers bringing e- e- expanding the cotton farming and, and and embedding it into our supply chain um and we're we're very very excited about the prospects of where this company is going and the possibilities they fascinating made in africa i want to talk a little bit more because i also want a 50% discount on all my purchases on made in africa i i love the clothing i love those uh, sweet headgears and everything um so um what was the idea behind i know there are lots and lots of companies who were doing handicrafts and like baskets and jute baskets and jute jewelry but made in africa is changing in a big way because it's also bringing out organic prints and organic clothes from africa from women who are making it uh, what is the i i mean i get what was the idea but where do you want to take made in africa next to what is what would be an ideal come out for that um well in a dream world we would be made in africa would be like the caring group or the lvmh of africa we think that um as you said there's so many amazing brands potential but where we we're, we're really trying to do is um bring um financing so that these companies so that the, the african companies can really go to scale i think like many things in africa they're hampered by access to to capital and um we've been fortunate enough to be able to access quite significant capital and we're hoping to scale that up over the coming years grow these brands but also allow them to take some of the brands that we get behind hopefully can take their place on the world stage so going from being a sort of niche local african brand to sitting alongside globally recognized brands because you've had the capital and you you've been allowed to play in the same marketplace much more on the impact coming up next lot of impact investors and people who are gold standard for sustainability uh you have seen how products are created what is the real need in the market at different different countries different different cities in africa when you make an investment what is an impact for you how do you measure it i think it's a very interesting question to be asked i've asked many of the leading bankers i know experts globally that the definition of impact i think is still yet to be truly defined i think i can talk to private bankers in london new york um hong kong lagos accra and 
everybody will give you a slightly different definition. I think that the world needs that clarity because depending on who you talk to, which asset portfolio, or depending on how they're doing their allocation, they define impact slightly differently. I think um, it's clear to us that, um, you know, there are things like job creation, there are things like um, impacting environments, um, sustainability, and so, so, so there are certain key niche boxes that most of these things tick. But I think the ultimate definition of impact really varies depending on who you're talking to. So for, for us, it would be, you know, you would be ticking key areas, as I said, creating jobs potentially, if you're not creating jobs, but the, the technology is improving living standards, it could be affecting the, the climate and, and the environment, as I just mentioned, or it could be affecting any of the 17 sustainable development goals. Um, there's been a clearly stronger emphasis globally on ESG, but there's, there's a fine nexus or in, inflection point between profits over people and planet, I guess is a, is a simpler way to describe it. And um, we try and ensure that the things that we do or the businesses that we invest in cover all of those um, key pillars. Wow. Um, that's like a lot of topics and the breadth of things to cover, but everyone hits home a very important point for different investments. Um, I know you have been looking a lot into a healthcare investments too, Kojo. Anything which you think you are ready to share with the world? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's still in cooking, but we have, um, I'm partnered with a few other partners in a, in a new fund that's been launched out of Luxembourg it's called the Vector Innovation Fund, just, just like we have Vector Global. Um, my partners there are actually English and Irish. It's, it's a globally focused fund, but obviously with my presence there, um, we have a strong Africa focus. Um, without getting too technical, I, we're focused on disruptive health technologies. I think the pandemic alone showed us again that um, we need disruptive health technology so that we are ahead of future pandemics. I think the world now knows that we're still going through this current COVID pandemic. We know that we were warned it was coming and we didn't hear the scientists' messages. And we also know that future pandemics are coming. And our fund is not just focused on pandemics, it's focused on disruptive healthcare in general with, with a vision to investing in the best technologies coming globally so that the world at large, and particularly our regions, you know, the, the emerging markets can be ahead of future um, health disastrous situations rather than reacting as the world has been now. And then also with what we're seeing currently with the vaccine inequality, we're also focused on making sure that, you know, certain regions have the capacity for self-sustainability and self-reliance. So then future, you don't have this disparity that, we're, that we currently have of some countries having hundreds of millions of vaccines, other countries having a few hundred thousand when we all know the um, interdependent nature of global healthcare and that we need to um, take care of each other, essentially. Kojo, what about your mental health? What music are you listening now? <laughs> what keeping uh, you at peace? <laughs> it depends what time of day. So if it's, if it's when I'm working out or doing exercise, it's probably hip hop. Um, if I'm chilling out more, it's um, Afro beats or, you know, if, if it's in the evening, sunset, it, it could be house music, but I think Afro Beats right now is my number one. I think um I know one die, I know one baby, I want enjoy, I want job life, I want buy motor, I want build house, I still want to know. It's just a reflection of the continent. It's a reflection of so much talent coming out. I mean, I'm actually a hip-hop head, but I've had to now recognize and bow to the talent of the Afro Beats. I've had to fully switch. I was 50-50, but I'm now you're a convert. <laughs> yeah, I've now fully, fully switched to the Afrobeats because they're just so there's much a new, There's a new impactful business idea, Kojo. We need to find amazing talent on Afrobeats and put them on the world stage. Yeah, well, they're putting themselves on, on the world stage and there's, there's more and more and more coming. Um, it's, 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 the music space is very, very exciting. I think um, they're really showcasing the talent of Africa to the world and they become the ambassadors of Africa to the world. Oh, absolutely. And music is the best way to connect across borders. My last question, Kojo, um, when people and most of our viewers and including me, when I think about Mr. Kofi Annan, I always remember the image of him with a really beautiful childish smile. 
and always have that twinkle in his eyes when you think about your father and it's a very different perspective what is one image which comes in your mind one image i mean it's it's, it's very hard for me to i mean i don't even know how to answer that question but definitely the um when you mentioned his smile he did always have a twinkle in his eye um probably took him back to being a sort of mischievous little young boy um probably remind me of my kids now but i think that that twinkle in his eye represented a bit of who he was and he was always um he was always very optimistic about life he challenged the most powerful to protect the most vulnerable each of us must share the pain of all who suffer and the joy of all who hope i think that's um that's a lesson that, that we take from him you know no matter what was going on he always found a positive and it was always, his message was always, you know you keep moving forwards and you know that you can always find a way so i think um that's the image that, that i keep with him i know that's what he want us to be doing yeah keep moving the continent forward kojo i think what i really find beautiful is people like you and us who have the uh privilege to be anywhere in the world live our life without any responsibility to greater good decide to go back it's really inspiring your journey of coming back to africa and taking responsibility of finding whatever small and big parts you can play to represent africa in a very different light across the globe thank you so much and please keep the fight going and the lights on and hopefully i'm still going to get that 50% discount on made in africa that's for sure good. for sure thank you thank you for having me really appreciate it thank you vince what a story it's just amazing when i got to learn about made in africa looking at the investments that uh, kojo is making and the power of moving private sector capital for good and the economic growth the the independence that it creates what a great testimony to the family legacy here and and i think more than the family legacy right when you have somebody who has the whole world to be in decides to come back to africa decides to invest all that gp money back in the country and then help them to take abroad i think that's the testimony of that there's a lot of potential in africa there are a lot of entrepreneurs who can be equal unicorns at new york stock exchange in the future and i i do believe empesa is just not one story to talk about from flutterweb to paga to lot of companies who have been raising multi million dollar rounds across the globe are supporting that story no question and so much more to come from the continent of africa something to be watching yeah that's all we have for you today for more more such amazing stories please do watch out fintech tv and looking forward to seeing you very soon on CNBC Africa on our impact show powered by Fintech TV.